Hello, welcome to the Restaurant Dealmaker Show. We're just going to wait a minute or two for a few people to jump in. Very excited to have you guys today. Very special, very special show happening today. We're excited. Welcome, welcome. Watching people drop in. Hope you guys all have your coffee. Hopefully you have your Zim's burger already ordered coming via Postmates or DoorDash. If not, there's a reason why you can't. I apologize about that. I'm so sorry. All right, well, I assume more people are gonna jump in. Well, my name is Jeremy Brockman. I'm the Director of Marketing for Restaurant Realty. And today we have a very special edition of the Restaurant Dealmaker Show with your, uh, your host, Steven Zimmerman, founder and principal broker of Restaurant Realty. And today I am putting Steve in the hot seat. And I mean uh, the spotlight uh, to talk about his amazing operational experience with Zim's restaurants. Now, for those of you that don't know, Zim's was the largest non-franchise restaurant chain in San Francisco for nearly 50 years. That was from 1947 through 1995. Um, Zim's was the largest privately held restaurant chain in the region with over 26 restaurants. Um, the family operated, uh, owned and operated um, such eateries also as Casa Carlitas, Kibbe's Drive-In on the peninsula, and Z's Bountiful Buffets. But all told, the, uh, the Zimmerman family ran 37 Bay Area restaurants, including locations in Sacramento, Yuba City, Hayward, Woodside, and several locations in Marin County. But one thing I will point out, feel free when you get a chance to peruse the legacy curated museum archive page at restaurantreality.com slash Zims. And there we have a treasure trove of photos and memorabilia and marketing collateral and imagery and all these sort of classic, almost uh, 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 Mad Men style black and whites that uh, are absolutely gorgeous and sort of sell the story. And um, but with that, Steve, are you ready? Imagine I'm ready, ready to go. Woohoo! Well, you've got an order, okay? I'm ringing the uh, bell. Oh yeah, um, we used to have bells before the POS <laughs> system came along. Right. Well, we are ready. All right, so Steve, here we go. Question number one. Please, please, please give me a little quick history of the Zimmerman family and how your amazing father, author, and how he started Zim's restaurants. Sure. Uh, my uh, grandfather, my father's father and mother, they immigrated from Poland to uh, California, San Francisco uh, in around 1920. Uh, at that time, my father was uh, about three years old. Uh, his, his, uh, his sister had not been born yet. She was born about a year after they arrived, and then my uncle about several years after that. So my, my grandfather was a painting contractor. He you know, painted houses and other kinds of commercial buildings, and that was his trade. And so when he came to San Francisco, that became his trade as well. Uh, he basically was a painting contractor. And so my father uh, basically uh, helped had to help the family, uh, you know, through his uh, upbringing to support the family. He had newspaper routes. He worked in a produce market. And when he turned 18, he graduated from high school. Uh, he decided he was a precocious guy and he always wanted to go into business. And since he had some prior business experience doing these different jobs, he decided to um, op open up a paint store. And the reason he decided a paint store was because he felt his downside was limited because his grand, his father was a painting contractor. So worst case scenario, he could, you know, if the business went, if it went out of business, he could just basically, you know, give his or sell his, his inventory to his father, you know, at, a, at cost or whatever. And uh, he had a short-term lease. It was only, you know, I think a six month or a year lease. So he didn't have a lot of long-term liability exposure there. So anyway, to make long story short, he ran the paint store for a number of years. It was basically, he mixed paints, he sold uh, he, uh, uh, sold uh, all kinds of paint sundries, brushes, ladders, uh, you know, all that kind of, anything related to painting and wallpaper. And he picked out colors for people. Oh, so wow. anyway, he was 18 when he opened this place and lo and behold, World War II came along and he got drafted. And so he basically handed the, the paint store over to his younger brother, my uncle, and my, my uncle ran the paint store and he went out to the army. And uh, 
the, one of the first things in the army was that they they basically you know gave him a physical and they gave him a a color uh, test and they found out he was colorblind. Oh, wow. <laughs> he'd been, he'd been, yeah, he'd been mixing paints for years for customer. Yeah, that's crazy. Which is, which is ironic. And so anyway, when he was in the service, uh, there were a lot of discussions with uh, his fellow soldiers about oh they they couldn't wait to get back to their the states. Uh, and have a juicy hamburger and a thick milkshake. And that's a story he, he basically said that led him to open up a specialty restaurant. So after he did his, uh, his four years in the, in, in the army, he came back, uh, took over the paint store, and my uncle uh, went off back, back off to World War II. He was, it was drafted. And so next door to the paint, this original location was on the corner of Lombard and Steiner, uh, which is in San Francisco in the Marina District. Uh, and so it was a five bay building and the paint store was in the corner bay. And then immediately west of that bay, there was another thousand square foot unit. And he opened up a 22 seat uh, restaurant, uh, all, ca- all counter restaurant, and especially made broiler uh, that he would basically broil the hamburgers in so they wouldn't be saturated on a flat grill and sit in the grease. So he had a specially designed broiler made, always served with hamburgers. Um, uh, hot apple pie, the special apple pie made by a local bakery, uh, and milkshakes and beverages. And that was it. Nothing else on the menu. And not even French fries. Uh, oh, because no fries. Hang that, on. To the, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, because in, in 40, 48, when he opened, uh, 47, 48, uh, they hadn't refined you know, oils, cooking oils to the extent they had today. And so you, you went to a typical diner in those days and you went in and Anybody that had fried food, the place just reeked of, of grease because they had, didn't have the refinement in, in the oil. So we didn't add French fries on our menu after we had been in business for, let's see, it was to 1965. It was almost, uh, was that almost 20 years with no, you know, hamburger joint with no French fries. Because yeah. he, he was true. And he used USDA choice chuck. He bought the whole chuck. We trimmed it and ground it at each store, made patties by hand, double ground the meat, made it by hand. So we controlled the fat lean ratio and it was all quality. It was quality. At, so his, his, his adage was, we'll cater to the masses of the classes. Uh, and uh, it was very successful. Um, there were lines to get in the place. And then that basically began his, uh, his, his chain, uh, you know, developing multiple locations as I mentioned in 65, we added, added uh, French fries. We, we added breakfast because we went into a hotel location, the exterior of a hotel. The hotel wanted us to serve breakfast. And then we extended our hours, 24 hours. So over the years, we, we went from a specialty you know, hamburger operation to a more, more d- diversified diner menu. You know, we had assortment of sandwiches, salads, you know, had some light dinner items. And a good percent of our stores were 24 hours. Wow. That's amazing. I still have a lot more to ask about paint, but you know what? We're going to, we're going to continue down this thread. So I'm going to pull on a few threads. So we'll just out of curiosity. When did you first get involved in this business and what, what point did you jump? Yeah, good question. You know, dad used to drag me into the restaurants when I was seven, eight years old, you know, with him on the weekend um, to, I guess he had to do some, you know, business with his managers, et cetera. Uh, and so he, you know, while he was doing his business, he'd say, you know, son, go, go in the back of the kitchen, help the cooks. And so what I would do is I would double grind meat. I would make patties. I would cut apple pies. You know, he had a apple pie cutter. Uh, I would, you know, they, they taught me how to make milkshakes and floats. And so I got my first taste when I was, you know, seven, eight years old going into the restaurants. Nice. And, and then, uh, you know, he, uh, always wanted me to come into the business. And since I was the oldest and a son. Uh, and uh, so when I, when I turned 13, I was in Boy Scouts and um, I wanted to go to a jamboree, which is like an international camping trip. And the cost was, you know, a couple hundred dollars. I, I approached my father. I said, gee, dad, I'd really like to go to this jamboree. It's a couple hundred dollars. He says, well, you know, I think it'd be a good idea if you earn the money yourself. So I said, well, where am I going to be? Dad move. Classic dad move, right? Huh? Oh, I said classic dad move, right? You yeah, got to earn it. Yeah. Well, it was this is a real orchestration because what 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 happened was my cousin, his first cousin, uh, uh, David, owned a gas station, and and in San Francisco, and so he had prearranged with my cousin 
to have me work there like on, you know, part-time uh, on, on the weekends during summertime so I could make some money. And unbeknownst to me until after I'd worked there for a number of years, a couple of years, that my father was paying my cousin to pay me. <laughs> and, and, his, and his ploy was so that when I turned 15, because supposedly you had to be 15 in San Francisco to get a work permit, which I don't think was really applicable if your parents own the business. But anyway, that was the story he told me. And so on my 15th birthday, I started working at Zim's on, a, on Saturdays as a dishwasher. And I, and, and I did appreciate it. I went from axle grease to kitchen grease. And I did because in the, in the dish, in the, in the, in, in the gas station, I was cleaning lube rooms, which is real dirty work. I was pumping gas and it was, it, it was a real pleasure going from that environment into a restaurant. Even if I had to clean toilets and, and wash dishes at a roof yeah. over my head, I got to eat what I wanted to eat when I wanted to eat. I was a lot of interaction with employees and customers and it was like a fun, you know, compared to what I had done. And so started washing dishes, did that for about a year. Then I started cooking. And through most of my high school years, again, during weekends, holidays, part-time during the summers, I worked, you know, through my high school years cooking. So I, I, I developed a pretty good expertise in, you know, fry cooking. Um, well, just a quick aside, I mean, were you no. the hero at your local high school based on the fact that here you had this job in the family business and there was this chains, like... Was it, were you well-received because you were in this uh, family business or was it? Uh... Well, you know, I, when you're working in a family business, you're always the owner's kid, you know? And so consequently, in order to have credibility, I would have to, you know, work harder than anyone, you know, work longer and harder. At that time, that was the attitude. Now I've learned, you know, working long and hard doesn't necessarily make you successful. It, uh, you got to work smart. But anyway, in that day, the day and age, you know, it was like restaurants, you know, you worked all the time. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think I was pretty well respected. I mean, I'm sure, you know, because I worked hard and, and they, they appreciated the fact that I, I started, you know, from the bottom and worked my way up. I just wasn't handed the golden key and, you know, your son take over as president CEO. It wasn't that way at all. Yeah. So, so anyway, um, I, I did that through high school. And then after a couple of college degrees and a stint in the service, I had to be in the service for uh, about two years. I got activated during the USS Pueblo situation. I was in the Air Force Reserve and I was in an oh, air wow. transport unit at Hamilton Air Force Base. So I ended up being in, uh, in, in food service. And so I had two years of cooking experience in the military, which was a, an interesting experience because they have very high standards in the Air Force. And so I learned a different perspective of institutional cooking uh, in my stint in the Air Force. And then uh, after my two years in the Air Force, went back to college, got a degree, then got a second degree. And then I, after, after graduating from Cornell Hotel School, I came into the family business. I started as a manager trainee. Um, and uh, then I became an assistant manager, uh, then a manager, and then I opened, uh, uh, was opening manager for probably a half a dozen different units where I opened new restaurants, you know, oversaw, you know, hiring the staff, hiring the management staff, overseeing the training, you know, implementing the whole uh, operation, and then ma managing some of those stores for a period of time. And then uh, I became an area manager uh, where I oversaw four or five units. You know, I had managers underneath me and, uh, and then worked my way up, became vice president um, and then uh, eventually president and CEO of the company and held that position for a number of years. And um, then in and we were opening new restaurants. Uh, we had a couple of different concepts. We had a Mexican restaurant concept, which we had a couple of units of called Casa Carlitas, uh, one in Hayward, one in San Francisco. But um, one, of the, one of the issues that we had, underlying issues, is that my father opened his first restaurant and he always took the position, well, you know, if I knew how to cook, I would only have one restaurant. And that attitude actually led him to uh, basically depend upon the union and he joined the union when he opened his first restaurant, the culinary union in San, in San Francisco, local too. And, uh, and unions at that time were friendly and it was a great mechanism for him to get well-trained people that had been in the industry for a number of years and he took a lot of pride in their job. And so he had it, like an instant personnel department already in place. He had the union basically feeding him these employees. 
And so over the years, the, the sort of the, the attitudes of the unions changed uh, and consequently um, it, it, it just became very difficult to operate uh, because of that you couldn't get, you couldn't, you couldn't fire an employee unless you went through an adjust, adjustment board hearing. You had to write up people, which is fine. But the, yeah. the, the, under, the underlying issue was that um, of the 4,000 restaurants in San Francisco, at the peak, there were maybe 300 restaurants. And of those restaurants, there was only two or three very small chains, like they had two or three units. We had 11 restaurants in San Francisco, wow. we the largest independent chain in the city uh, that was union. And the smaller operators, they could, they could basically finesse dealing with the union stringent requirements um, uh, like, you know, short shift premiums and, uh, you know, excess uh, overtime, et cetera, because they, they were, the owners were working those units themselves. But for us as a chain, we didn't have that latitude. So the bottom line is our labor costs really got out of control. They were about a third higher than our competitors and it was difficult to compete. Um, and so um, we basically, uh, you know, ended up having a strike, um, you know, and uh, which culminated in really unwinding our business um, and led to the demise of our business. We lost the strike, um, you know, and uh, that was in the 80s. And so consequently, that's how, sort of how Zim sort of unwound. Yeah. Uh, fortunately. Listen, it's a, it's, listen, there's to every great Google story, which I believe you were an early Google for Silicon Valley and San Francisco, there's obviously external factors, but let's let's switch gears for a sec because I sure. want to focus on uh, on how Zim's you know zimmed away, but rather let's you know the things that celebrated here. So I I know first of all I already know that I already have some questions from the audience, but just so happens that it's related to my next question. Sure. So, um, you know, you know, one of the questions was, what's the greatest attribute your father taught you that has helped you achieve where you are today? Yeah. I was curious to learn about. Sure. You know, yeah, like, yeah. I, I think there are definitely some some major things I learned from my father. Uh, one of the major things is that the busiest people have the most time to get the most things done. And uh, I think without a doubt, you know, he, he lived up to that, you know, not only being involved in restaurants, he was very active in, in real estate. As an investor, he was very active in doing a lot of nonprofit work. He was president of many nonprofit organizations. Oh, wow. um, he, he was he was very active in, you know, in all, a lot of other things other than just the restaurant business. And, and I think his involvement, you know, sort of underlines his adage that the busiest people have the most time to get the most things done. And he was also a, a strong proponent of and the reason his motivation for getting involved and which led a good example for me as I in fact last two years I've been president of a major nonprofit lending institution. Um, was the fact that he, 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 he basically instilled in me the principle that, um, you know, you really need to give back to the community and you get, need to give, uh, you know, you give, when you give back to the community, you actually, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a service, but you're in a lot of cases, you're, you end up getting more than you give back. I mean, you yeah, know, just satisfaction, helping people less fortunate than you. Um, and so that was a, a big message that he, he got out to me. Um, and I, another th thing is that you don't compromise price for quality. He was always very quality oriented. And if, it's, you know, the, if the price in order to maintain the quality and maintain the portion control rather than to, you know, screw around with, you know, diminishing the quality, yeah. you know, he'd raise the price and to maintain that quality level. And so that was a very important point, you know, don't compromise price for quality. Um, and then another important point is that the customer is always right. And, you know, that's sometimes hard to stomach because obviously there are some customers that are, can get somewhat testy, but there are diplomatic ways to diffuse that, you know, if you just use some good psychology, but, and have that underlying commitment to the issue that you know the customer is always right they're the one that that's paying paying the bills so to speak i think it's important for our audience to also know that we're talking 1947 to 1995 in san francisco for those that don't know the landscape it's like this is a 
you know, this is the birth of many movements and many different, you know, but we won't get into that today. We're not here to- Oh, the flower, flower children era. Yes, Haight-Ashbury in 65. Yeah, seriously. Oh, yeah. Lots in of- 60s, the 70s. It's like, this is, so people enjoyed your burgers could have been the hippies that were protesting, you know, oh, yeah. or down to, so yeah. Um, sure, definitely. So some of the other important things he taught me was that the customer, okay, we said that the customer's always right, uh, have empathy in dealing with people. That's, I think, very important. Uh, people are the most important asset. In fact, I have a plaque on, on my uh, shelf in my office. Uh, it says, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. nice. And, I, and that ha was instilled with me. He had, he had a strong policy that everybody in the company, no matter whether it was the lowest dishwasher, janitor, called him Art. He did not want to be called Mr. Zimmerman. Everyone called him, you know, Art. You know, we had holiday parties every year, you know, everyone come up to him, you know, hi, Art, you know, and that's what he insisted upon. And, and, and that's that sort of, that, that trickled down to my mindset as well. You know, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, it's more important to be nice than to be important. You know, yeah. and people are really the most important asset in, in any organization. And so those are some of the key things that I've learned from my father. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I appreciate that. And again, you know, I'm keeping focus, but I'm going to have a lot of follow-up questions for you in terms of, uh, we still have to get back a little bit into your Air Force because you basically were Top Gun. You were basically catering for Top Gun people. But anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. Give me, um, can you share an example of a, maybe like a really successful moment while you were managing Zim, something that kind of sparks a, a little yeah. like joy in you? Yeah, well, I think that uh, definitely when we opened the new restaurant uh, and I was involved in the training and the hiring uh, in a lot of the new restaurants we opened um, when I came onto the scene full time, uh, it was great to see the whole operation come together. Uh, you know, and after a couple of dry runs, you know, before we opened to the public, we had, you know, in, invited vendors and, you know, special guests had some nonprofit events so we could get, you know, work out all the bugs of, of the, of the operations, you know, the service procedures, the cooking procedures, all the nuances before we opened the doors to the public. But when we ultimately opened up the doors of the public and we started to get busy and we started to, you know, consistently, uh, you know, get good quality product out with, you know, good service level and a clean environment. That was very gratifying, very satisfying, seeing us be able to create, you know, in a lot of cases, we took over restaurants that failed. Uh, in some cases, we took over this one restaurant. There were like 11 restaurants before we came and we had a 25 year run in that, this location. And that was true in many of our locations. We took over, this, this is the wrong concept or, or poorly operated. And because we had a, a well-tuned machine, uh, you know, we were able to basically convert unsuccessful locations into successful operations. And so that was very gratifying to see the success. Yeah. Um, and another really uh, particularly gratifying time was we, we decided we opened the Sims in Hayward. Um, and it was the first time we really went to blue collar area. And, and at, at that point, I think our, just our pricing and our quality level was just a little ahead of what the market was really looking for there. So consequently, it was a marginal location, but next to it was a big form of 7,500 square foot smugglers in. And my father got this idea, oh, let's, let's do a dinner house concept. And I, we questioned a little bit because again, it was a blue collar area. So we call it arts, uh, good food and high spirits. And it was a disaster. It was the reason we, we, bought, we bought this restaurant was because smugglers in, it had a heavy Disc, discos were really big then. So about 50, 60% of their business was disco business. So it was very profitable. So we, we emulated the disco uh, co uh, format as part of our food concept. We improved the food, they had the disco, but we never got a shot to really get the restaurant up and running because the disco image overwhelmed the, the, the food image. Uh, we were known as a disco and not as a food place. So bottom line, didn't work. Uh, and I met this, this gentleman that had success running Mexican restaurants. And I said, hey, could we do a management contract to you? And we think we have a good location for a Mexican restaurant. And he basically came up with this Casa Carlitas concept. And it was very successful. It turned around the restaurant. And we had a run for about 10 years. Oh, wow. This That's conversion great. from this high-end dinner house, you know, 
slash disco, uh, which was really more known as disco slash, you know, dinner place, <laughs> uh, and ran this very successful, uh, heavy price value oriented uh, Casa Carlitos. That, that was, I think, that and opening up new new restaurants that turned out to be successful were the highlights of my you know restaurant said, steve you know we do a good job of saying that restaurant reality sells bars and, and and bar business restaurant businesses bar businesses and i know we talk a lot about club businesses but we've never spoken about the fact that you owned and operated a disco business that's a big deal we'll have to we're gonna have to talk about that uh, as well as uh to expand yeah, we, that we're, we uh, had several bar operations as part of our zims operations um so we were definitely immersed in the bar business, but our primary focus was, was obviously the restaurant business. You know, what, what did I learn in the restaurant business that helped me in developing restaurant uh, realty? And I would say that, you know, without a doubt, you know, having empathy and dealing with people, certainly understanding restaurant sellers, uh, restaurant buyers and restaurant landlords, uh, having, you know, worn the hats of each of these positions obviously gives me a, a a lot of advantage, I think, in terms of, you know, realistic expectations and and goals of, you know, a buyer, a seller, a landlord, you know, again, having been in those those seats. So very grateful that, you know, I had the opportunity of, you know, learning that uh, that has served me well at Restaurant Realty. I also understand the challenges of running a business, you know, including, you know, the organization skills, you know, communications, uh, planning, budgeting, you know, financial analysis, quality control, uh, and most importantly, working with people at different levels. Uh, that has served me very well at, at Restaurant Realty. And, you know, fortunately, most, most of our agents and brokers, you know, come from similar backgrounds as me. Uh, they own their restaurants in a lot of cases. And, in, you know, in some cases, that's how they ended up you know, being agents with Restaurant Realty, they were clients as sellers and we sold their restaurants. Um, that happened, you know, with Jim, it happened with Andy, it happened with uh, Patrick. Um, and uh, it's, you know, very, uh, you know, they, they, they have a similar attitude and our other agents and brokers, you know, who've worked in restaurants in various capacities, management and non-management, uh, having worked with people at different levels serves them well in understanding the realities of, you know, what we do. Um, and, um, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the things, uh, you know, my personal philosophies uh, that I think have contributed to my success at Restaurant Realty is it's, as I said earlier, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And I seriously believe that and practice that daily. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to treat everyone with respect and be empathetic with people at all different levels, you know, be kind, you know, there's enough unfortunate people in this world that, you know, don't practice that. And, you know, I think the, the world would be a much better place if people just were more empathetic and more human in dealing with people. Uh, it's important to, to be respectful to everyone. And I think it's important not to let success, you know, get to your head. Um, and, you know, I, I've always, you know, been a firm believer of whatever goes up, you know, in other words, whatever becomes successful can always go down. And, um, you know, I've learned from a number of failures in life that you just cannot be complacent and just, you know, sit on your laurels and expect that, you know, everything is going to be wonderful. Uh, that's just, that's the way life works. You know, there's ups and downs. And hopefully you have more ups than downs. Um, and uh, I think one, one of the things I've learned that definitely has helped me to minimize uh, dealing with the, you know, the, the positives and negatives of life is that try to plan ahead, you know, for the unexpected and, you know, be proactive rather than act than reactive. In other words, try to expect that, you know, things just not are always going to go right. You know, on my things to do list, I have uh, two, two uh, mottos that are always on the top. One, one says SW, SW, SWN, which means some will, some won't, so what next, which means that, you know, obviously some things are going to work out, some things, you know, may work out, some will work out, but just be prepared to move on 
to the next, you know, opportunity. You know, if things just don't work out as you hope that they will work out. And that's sort of the story of life. Um, and, and also, uh, I have another motto on the top of my things to do list. It says, leave nothing to chance because, you know, inevitably things just not are always going to go as, as planned that that's just the story of life. Um, so how, how is restaurant realty different than other brokers? Well, first of all, we are specialists. We only sell restaurants, bars, clubs, and other related uh, food service businesses. You know, that would include, you know, catering companies, commercial kitchens, food trucks, institutional feeding opportunities, et cetera. And, uh, and, and we specialize in selling, you know, uh, related commercial buildings. So in other words, to be true to our, our specialty, a building, if we're selling a building, it has to have either a restaurant and we're selling the restaurant, it has to have uh, a bar or a club or some other food service business, which is owned by that operator and owns the building. And so we have, you know, successfully sold, you know, over 60, uh, what we call related commercial buildings. Um, again, specializing on, on, on that. Um, we, so again, things that uh, set us apart that make us different from other brokers, we specialize. Um, we, we have a proprietary database which we've accumulated, uh, you know, with after 26 years of being in business, we have over 60,000, you know, buyers in our database. Uh, we communicate with them weekly, you know, in our e-newsletter, uh, talking about new listings, uh, featured listings. Uh, oh, welcome back. Welcome back. I am so sorry. I'm I was very lonely. You know what? Myself. Listen, you told me that there were no French fries for the first couple of years. Oh, you went out for an order of fries. Ah. And... And um, Spectrum, uh, otherwise, you know, formerly known as Time Warner, decided just to shut off all the cable in the area. So we're, it's oh, really? not just me, um, about, I don't know, 10,000 homes just turned off accidentally for the last eight minutes. So oh my goodness! thank you all for not panicking. And I'm hoping that you've danced in the moment, Steve. I saw you froze. And so I started talking I'm like, oh, you know what? No worries, Steve. You know, when you unfreeze, not knowing that it was me that you do not listen at Zim's. We do never, you never serve frozen meat. It was, I remember that you said that you bought the chuck shelves, you All cooked it, you made your own things. Yeah. So. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, when you're talking, going back to the Zim's thing again, a few interesting tidbits. My father supposedly said he invented the sesame bun, which I don't believe, but supposedly <laughs> they didn't have buns with sesame seeds, you know, in 1947. So there's a local baker uh, and uh, it was a commercial baker. So he went to him and, and said, hey, uh, is there some way you can get a sesame seed on the bun? And so supposedly, you know, again, I think that's a lot of hype, but he, that's, that's what he maintains. Uh, and um, and it also another, another list, list, another adage about Zim's, um, we, we trained our food service. We only had one dessert. It was apple pie, you know, for many years. And so we had the special apple pie with the cinnamon sauce. And so a customer could have it with or without the, the apple pie was always heated. And so it was heated with this hot cinnamon sauce. And so the, the food servers were trained to ask the customer, not if they wanted a hot apple pie, but yeah, do you want your apple pie with, you know, a vanilla ice cream on top of the cinnamon sauce or with melted cheddar cheese. That's the way he trained his people. So they automatically they didn't ask the customer if they wanted dessert. It's just, how do you want your apple pie? It was easy because we had one dessert. Yeah. But he was a real salesman, and that's that's you know that that helped plus sales, obviously. Yeah, no, that's awesome and amazing. I mean, listen, sat listen. Well, 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 let me ask. Let me go back at you to some questions I had before I decided to freeze. Um, some of these subjects, by the way, I've covered. So, it, it, well, we'll, anyway. we'll we'll find out. Yes. Um, were there other were there other family members that were brought into the business, or were you the golden child and you happen to excel at this, and therefore? That's the reason why you were so successful. I know you have special skills, so I know already the answer. I know about that. Anyway, it's just um, uh, we had uh, over the years very few uh, family members. We had I had a cousin, a first cousin that came in and worked uh, successfully for a number of years, uh, but decided that the restaurant business was really not for him. So he parted. He worked, started his I think cooking and uh, or maybe washing dishes, cooking, and then uh, went into management. But again. 
he decided you really want to do his own thing, his own business and unrelated to restaurants. Other than him, uh, my sisters um, were, you know, uh, when we opened new stores, maybe as initially as a hostess, you know, just for a very short period of time, but not, not seriously in the business. I was really the only serious family member. And, you know, in talking about that's a good, good thing to talk about is, you know, having family in business, it's, it, you know, it's a real double-edged sword. It either works great or it does not work. And the reason it worked well with, between me and my father was because, uh, you know, my father knew I had learned all the different, you know, aspects of the business before I, you know, became the hotshot of the company. I had to work my way up. Um, and in addition to that, I had to work hard. You know, I worked, you know, it was in those days, 70, 80 hour weeks was common, you know, working in the restaurant business. And that's what we did. And I did. Now, did it help that he knew you were smarter than him because you were in the Air Force and he was only a GI and yeah, did that was, affect things? Well, he was enlisted and I was enlisted. So we were, you know, we were at the same level. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, um, so uh, anyway, uh, and he had a lot of other interests, you know, real estate, non-community uh, work, nonprofit work. And so, uh, you know, we very rarely had any conflicts, you know, uh, he would be brought in, obviously, before we signed a lease on a new location, he would have to sign off on that. If we were making major concept changes, you know, design changes in the restaurant, uh, making me menu changes, you know, before we did you know, put new menu items on, you know, he'd be part of a tasting. So he, he was involved in the major areas, but not on the day-to-day -day operational side. And so we got along very well. Um, Let me ask a question. Like, so like what motivated the most in terms of, what influenced the most in terms of these expansions of stuff? Was it that, uh, that opportunities presented it that you guys were always aware, like this is a hot corner and this unit didn't make it. And so you guys like, well, we can probably convert that to one of our restaurants or were there other factors that helped you expand that uh, people approached you just out of curiosity? Well, I think uh, because we were, you know, visibly very successful, we had a lot of customers in our stores all the time, um, landlords and or brokers would be constantly uh, you know, pursuing dad for new, new opportunities. Um, and, and then he, there was a certain amount of creativity on his part in finding new locations. Like for example, there was a chain uh, called Foster's, which was like a cafeteria chain. It had been around a long time. I think it started in the thirties or forties and they ultimately went bankrupt and they had a number of key locations in the city. One of which was on the ground floor of a 500 room hotel in downtown San Francisco on the corner of Powell. Powell Street is where the cable cars you know, start. Uh, Powell and Sutter, which is like two blocks from Union Square, which is the heart of downtown San Francisco. They, they went bankrupt and before they could even open this location, they had signed a lease on this location. Um, my father had learned about it and went to the bankruptcy court and bought the lease in bankruptcy court. And we ended up buying the lease. The lease rate was like 50 cents on the dollar. And we ultimately ended up selling that lease after we opened the restaurant and ran it for a number of years that the owner of the hotel said, hey, you know, we really want that restaurant. We know you have a below market lease. We'll pay you a big price to buy it back. So he you know, actually ended up selling that lease for millions of dollars oh, because wow. we were paying 50 cents on the dollar in a prime 5,000 square foot location in downtown. So, so he would do create, you know, he had these creative opportunities that came to him, you know, you know because they saw that we knew what we were doing and we, but any, and he was very strong on most of our locations were corners. That was very important. Or if we were in line, we were in, in a strategic location. Location was paramount. You had to have, because we, we were somewhat, we were an impulse oriented, you know, operation to some extent. So people would see us and say, okay, let's go and, you know, go to Zim's. Well, let me ask a question. Cause I think one thing that might be on some people's mind, we have a question about, what was competition like? I mean, did did McDonald's and other chains, did other franchises come into the place or did they see you guys having as a great stronghold that everyone feared coming into San Francisco? What was it like? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good question. Um, actually, you know, most of the chains were afraid to come into San Francisco because of the unions and they just unions were not part of their MO. And so uh, McDonald's opened their first restaurant in 1965 on Ocean Avenue uh, near City College in San Francisco. And, you know, they, they started, unions started picketing them, but when they saw that, you know, that they weren't getting anywhere, they eliminated the picketing. And so then consequently, uh, that was the really the beginning of, 
the chain, non-union chains, when McDonald's opened that first location in 65. Prior to that, there weren't any real major chains in San Francisco of any consequence. And so when other chains saw that McDonald's were opening up units and opening up non-union, that was an, uh, you know, an enticement for some of these other chains yeah. to follow. And then, and so what happened was obviously they had some impact on our business, even though our quality level was, you know, extremely higher, you still basically, you know, they cannibalized our, some of our customer base to some extent, and they could, their prices were extremely more competitive than ours because they didn't have union labor, you know, and in their situations, you know, maybe food cost was 25, 30% and labor was 15%. So their cost of goods and their prime cost, food and labor are maybe 45, 50% where our prime costs we were running a 25% uh, food cost with a 40% labor cost. So our prime costs were like, you know, 10 to 20% higher, you know, which is where all the profit was. And the reason we could survive as long as we did in the city after, you know, McDonald's opened their first store in 65 is dad had negotiated these long-term leases with below market rents. Our rents were averaging two to 3% of sales where most people are paying then six to 8%. Now, you know, lucky to pay 10%. In the city, but at that time we were paying two or three percent rents, so we had that cushion with the low wow. rent to offset the high operating costs, the high labor costs. Our indirect labor costs were a third higher than our competitors. Yeah. And so what happened? That gave us the uh, the lifeline to survive, you know, for X number of years. But then when those leases ended and and we went to an option, a fair market rent option our rents went up 25, 30%, we lost that spread. So they're having two to 3% rents, we were having five to six to 8% rents. And that ate up our cushion from absorbing that extraordinary high labor cost in San Francisco. Well, I know you wrote that great article about landlords are the key. Uh, and now you and I now know that you you know that firsthand from this experience, it's a, yeah. a tough lesson to learn. Very much so, very much so. I have another question from the audience. We'll start, I'll start peppering. I still have a few of my Q and A, but I want to get sure. some. No, I've covered a number of those questions uh, while you were off. Oh, got it. While I was MIA, see, I went to the army. I needed to come back in order to be an equal at the table. I see. Um, so did you get your French fries? Um, I did not get any French fries. Oh, I'm sorry I think I think my internal organs are like a broiled burger right now, but that's something I'll deal with after. Okay. All right. What, what other are there other restaurants out there that you would say are similar to the Zim's model that you feel like, wow, I respect this chain or this, you know, is there something you've come across? Well, you know, I, I've asked that. Um, I would say that, you know, Mel's uh, maybe to some extent although I'm not sure that their quality level, certainly not in the hamburger area, was there were very few companies that had the, the quality level that we had on the hamburger side. And that was our main you know, specialty. In fact, we were called, our name of our company was Zim's Broiled Hamburgers until we started diversifying our menu you know, as we got into these locations that demanded breakfast and longer hours and more diversity on the menu. And then we dropped the broiled hamburgers and this became Zim's and more of a, a, an upscaled coffee shop. So I would, I, the most analogous uh, concept I can think of is, is the former Hamburger Hamlet chain in, in uh, Los Angeles. They at one time had about a dozen stores. They had really high quality, you know, uh, quick leisure service uh, operations. Um, but, you know, we, we had definitely a unique niche. Well, one thing I'll tell to our, our audience, if you want to go to restaurantreality.com slash Zims later today, you can actually see a, a number of screenshots of or photos of the older menus. And so you can, of course, get a sense of the economy of scale for me to get a creamy milkshake for 35 cents combined for only 65 cents to get my broiled burger. I mean, all of us are hungrier now for having started this show, but that's another yeah. discussion. So um, another key question, which I actually meant to ask, and so thank you to the person who asked it. Um, did Zim's own the real estate of any of these restaurants? And if not, why? You know my father was, you know, when he was 22, he, he learned from his father uh, that, you know, you, you should earn own real estate. It's just, a, it's a good, it's a good hedge on inflation. It's a good way to, to acquire uh, wealth, you know, through appreciation. And so when he was 22 years old, he bought his first apartment building and he didn't have any much money at, and leverage at that time was really, you know, key, the key way that a lot of people in the 40s and 50s and 60s made money is that they would get a you know a first loan, second loan, third loan, fourth loan. So he bought his first apartment building when he was 22 with four loans on, you know, very little, very little uh, you know, equity. 
And so he, what he would try to do is after he opened the restaurant, he uh, would try and it became relatively successful. He would try to buy, you know, get invested in some other commercial real estate venture. Now he tried to buy a number of his locations over the years. And in most cases, the landlord just would not, they didn't want to sell. But to answer your question specifically, yeah, we did buy a number of our locations. Um, uh, in fact, the, 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 our first location, uh, we're a partner in that building uh, with uh, the original owner of that building that owned it for like, I don't know, 70 years is, is wow. I deal with his uh, granddaughter. And um, we have a Michi's Pizzeria in there. And then we, 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 we had, we bought a number of our, our buildings over the years, but uh, uh, by and large, most of our landlords didn't want to sell, you know, they wanted. And, Got it. Which made McDonald's even more of a competitor at one point. But that's another business course that we don't need to go through right now. Right. Um, so look, so I apologize. You may have answered. Did you already go through your personal philosophies? Yeah, um, I did. I handled did. that. Okay. Yeah, I handled no that. And, uh, yeah. How, how is restaurant realty different than other brokers? You know, I, I talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, the fact that we, you know, we have, as I indicated earlier, you know, all, most of our brokers and agents have been in the business, you know, been owners in a lot of cases, and they have empathy, understand the seller side, the buyer side, and the customer side, and, and the landlord side, because they had to deal with all those factors. Um, well, let's, jump, let's jump to another question, yeah. first of all, too. I mean, there was a period, because I'm, I'm curious, I think, and some people will be interested to learn a little bit about this. There was a buffer between the time that you closed Zim's and when you opened up Restaurant Realty. Yeah. Um, what, like, what, what, can you point to one moment that you realized? Was it immediate that as you were closing down Zim's and having to deal with obviously markets of scale, we don't need to get into all the details, but what, was there a moment that crystallized that you realized, wow, I want to help others or you know, what happened? What was your, yeah. well, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. What, what basically pivoted me from restaurant operations uh, into brokerage was that the realization is after we lost the strike, we had accumulated a lot of debt, in fact, millions of dollars of debt. And so, um, and I quite frankly, wasn't really um, motivated to continue being in the business, realizing that I still had to deal with the union in San Francisco where most of our restaurants were. And I just, I wasn't, I wasn't operating on a, on a even playing field, you know, dealing yeah. with all these non-union, you know, players that, you know, had, you know, a third less, you know, cost that indirect labor cost uh, that we had. And so it was hard to be competitive. And so I pretty much made my mind after we lost the strike that I was going to get out of the business. And so I, I, for a period of time, I was actually, I, I was became a deep shelter syndicator and I basically um, put together about 14 limited partnerships. Uh, we had about 350 limited partners and we had about a thousand multi-use resident, multi-residential units. So that was a part of the my career where I really learned commercial real estate, although I dabbled in it, you know, before, um, you know, in my early years, dad had encouraged me, like, like he got involved when he bought his first apartment building when he was 22, for me, when I got out of college to start, you know, buy a little condo, buy, you know, and start accumulating real estate. So he planted that into my seed. And so consequently, you know, I decided when the, I could see that the restaurant, you know, part of, the, of our career was going to come to an end, I thought, mm, I should try to pick a field that I could integrate my commercial real estate experience with and my restaurant operating experience. And so, so I thought, mm, I think a good field would be like restaurant real estate, restaurant. And so I didn't, I was never, a, uh, I, although I had sold a lot of homes over the years, you know, from my own, own account, I had never really, uh, you know, sold businesses. Uh, the businesses that we did sell, I used outside brokers for. And so uh, when, I, when I knew I wanted to go in this field, I went to the guy that used to sell our restaurants and I said, hey, can I work with you? And he said, are you crazy? You're going to basically learn my business, take my, take my customers and basically be my major competitor. That's not going to happen. So I ended up working for a general business brokerage company for one year called Business Team. And when I, when I was hired by the president, you know, I told him my, my focus here. I said, listen, I've tried enough diversified things over the years. Uh, and I really want to focus on just doing the restaurant sales business. He says, oh, no, you can do that. You're going to be a general business broker like everybody else here. And you're going to sell, you know, you're going to sell grocery stores and laundromats and 
manufacturing companies and every other kind of business that down the main street business that we saw. I said, I don't think so, Ian. I think sort of learned over the years that I, to really be successful, you got to focus on this particular area and just keep hammering on that and be the best you can in that area and that arena. Yeah. And he says, well, you'll see, it won't happen. So I, I, I worked there for a year just doing restaurant sales, started, you know, prospecting, getting listings, et cetera, and selling them. And after one year I left and that was 1995 and 1996, January, 1996, I started restaurant realty. So to answer your question, yes, my experience as a restaurant owner operator and uh, being involved as an investor in commercial real estate has really served me well in terms of, you know, being successful at restaurant realty. Got it. And so basically just to let the, our viewers know, um, uh, uh, the rock was coming out in theaters during this January of 1996. So Steve also probably got really motivated by Sean Connery and realized, well, if he can break out of Alcatraz, I can break into real estate sales. Right. Is that, yeah, I think that that was it. Yeah. That was the, motive. <laughs> that was it. Right. That was it. <laughs> it gave me the light. Got it. Sorry. This is just my entertainment bug. I apologize. That's okay. That's well, not... I know we have a, we have a couple of key questions that I want to make sure get answered and I, sure. I want to go back. Um, so one, another gentleman asked, but did Zim's own any restaurants outside of the Bay Area? Yes, we had restaurants in Hayward. Uh, we had restaurants uh, in San Mateo. Well, that's Bay Area. San Mateo, Woodside, Sunnyvale. Uh, and then we were in Sacramento. What happened was we got involved. My father got involved with this one developer and he owned a, a bunch of, uh, he had, like owned about a hundred different movie theaters. And then he got involved in developing shopping centers and he approached dad he knew him through the community and said, uh, hey, Art, you know, would you like to open up some restaurants in some of my shopping centers? So we opened up about four or five uh, units in his shopping centers in Sacramento and in Yuba City, which is far north. So we had restaurants uh, up there. Uh, and unfortunately, again, our, our, our level of quality and our pricing was just not commensurate with the, the marketplace in Sacramento and Yuba City in, in that time frame. And Consequently, those restaurants, you know, didn't work. And uh, so we, you know, closed them. I don't, I don't know the particulars. That was before I was, you know, full time in the rest. I was still going to high school at that time. Got it. Well, I have another couple of questions from the audience. So another one was just to kind of learn a little bit about restaurant reality and our experience, given that we had, given that you have this past experience of owning and operating so many restaurants. Do you feel that makes you more prepared for helping others with franchises and have multiple units? And how does that affect your well, experience when you're- Yeah, there, there's no question that that experience certainly, I think serves me well in counseling people that are so motivated to get involved in, you know, multiple operations. So the follow-up uh, question is, do you feel- Or operations. Do you feel an affinity for other burger joints and sympathize with those that are looking to sell or not sell or having to sell? Or you you feel nothing now at this point. Uh, <laughs> I, I I have sympathy and uh, empathy for all restaurant operators whose economic expectations are not being met. Put it that way. And unfortunately, you know, in the non-franchise, non-chain world, you know, fifty percent of restaurant owners you know go out of business the first three years, and eighty percent the first five years. So that I've got a lot of you know empathy for that kind of situation where people, you know, bust their butts and put a lot of money at risk and, and are not successful. Yeah. Does not make me very happy. Being those another, another question was about given that you've operated, first off, you've survived. Well, you didn't survive on a personal note, the unionization of San Francisco, but yet you've operated restaurant reality during September 11, subprime meltdown, the great recession, and now the, uh, the, the pandemic what would you say is a lesson learned, you know, that might be from a Zim's era? Maybe it's just your work ethic, but what would you say has made you stronger than the uh, average bear? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, definitely uh, the Great Recession, you know, we, we were still fairly busy, busy. I mean, we were still selling 40, 50 restaurants a year, you know, between 2008, 2010. Um, and during COVID, uh, you know, since COVID, we've sold close to 225, you know, businesses, either lease uh, or sold business, buildings, business. So we've done over 200, close to 225 transactions. So uh, a lot, there's been in those kind of timeframes, you know, we end up selling a lot more businesses that 
what we call our asset sales that are not profitable or marginally profitable uh, versus the good times where we're selling more businesses that are going concern businesses that are profitable and people are buying the, the proprietary items, the name, the menu, the concept, et cetera. But the, again, the, the, the activity level is still very high even during these challenging periods because there are a number of people that you know are always curious to get in the business. Um, and especially now in COVID, we're finding our buyers, who are the buyers today in COVID? Yeah, post-COVID, it's basically, you know, uh, there are people that, you know, are, are tired of, of working for other people and they want to be their own boss and, co and control their destiny. So they're, 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 you know, either former employees of restaurants. Uh, and then we're getting people that are people that have worked for other businesses, not food service businesses that, you know, want to try their hand in the restaurant business. And frequently they will couple with someone that's had some operating experience and they come in. Um, and uh, people that were unemployed during the pandemic that again, they're, they're, they're the, are the buyers. So there's, oh, there's plenty of buyers, you know, even at these very challenging, through these very challenging periods. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to see these historical parallels. Like your father started Zins coming off of World War II and the success and the growth and expansion of the American dream and so forth. Is there, are there other noticeable trends that, okay, coming off of maybe not even just, you know, you know, the last, you know, 10, 15 years, but look, you're in San Francisco, you're, you're uh, close to Silicon Valley. Are there more venture capitalists that try to get into the restaurant business? Or are there people who just sort of have happen to have money and want to diversify? Do you, do you see any patterns of certain types or, does it really run a full gamut across the board of the types of buyers that come in? Yeah, I, I think it runs a full gamut, you know, across the board. I don't think venture capitalists are enticed coming in the restaurant business, especially in California, where the margins are are smaller because of the high, you know, operating costs, the high occupancy costs, and food and labor costs, etc. So I, I don't see them as being part of the buyer pool. Uh, but they're just, uh, you know, people in general that are enamored with, uh, you know, the food service business, uh, they think that they can make a living at it. They can, some, some cases, put their family members to work, you know, and they, you don't have to have a lot of, uh, you know, high education, a tremendous skill level. You just got to basically work hard and be committed to good service and, you know, consistent food quality and cleanliness levels, et cetera. And so there are a lot of mom and pops that, are enticed to come in the business to make a living and have their family members have a, have a job. Yeah. Now I know today's a, a unique day. This is probably one of the first times that you've spoken about your Zim's experience and so forth. But um, I, I imagine that uh, I hope that the demand will come that we will be setting up a university course about the lessons learned from Zim's and the power of broiled burgers over, over uh, uh, grilled burgers. And we're going to have to have another class about that very All soon. Right. Sounds like an interesting idea. <laughs> Are there any parting words um, that you'd like to share with uh, aspiring uh, buyers and or sellers uh, that are listening to today's show and hearing about your Zim's experience and what you might uh, might help them in the future? Sure. Well, I think uh, irrespective of all the challenges today of uh, you know running a successful food service uh, business, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity uh, if you align yourself with the, the proper uh, level of, you know, trained individuals that have been in the business that understand, you know, the importance of good service, uh, consistent food quality, and, you know, a clean environment. Uh, and you're, you know, you, you're sensitive to, you know, having a price value experience for your customer. Uh, there's still plenty of opportunity. You know, people like to eat out uh, and they're tired of their own cooking. They, you know, eating out is a form of entertainment. Uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way for people to diversify their, uh, their, their, their palate in terms of different you know, types of food. So there's a strong market for eating out. And of course, you know, some of, the, some of the, the basics have changed. You know, obviously, you know, you know, takeout delivery is, is taken hold and drive through business and you know, a lot of uh, you know, creative ways to, uh, to, you know, to be served food, not necessarily just in the hard brick and mortars environment. But again, by and large, people want to go the brick and mortars. And consequently, a lot of operators are, you know, reformatting their brick and mortars. So they have more outdoor seating, more spacing, and are sensitive to the needs of today's market. One final question, which is a great one. Otherwise, I wouldn't ask it. But do you recommend buyers look 
to purchase um, high profit restaurants for a high price or an asset sale at a much lower price and build the business to make high profits? Is there something it really depends on the level of expertise of the individual buyer. You know, so it, it, I just don't have one general response to that. A lot of people feel more comfortable buying a going concern when it's set up long history of making money because they figure the risk factor is less if they can maintain the you know, continuity of the customer flow and the cash flow if they just you know, don't screw it up and run it just as the previous operator did. Uh, so there are a number of people that are attracted to that MO, you know, method of operation and others. They've had a lot of experience and rather than pay a big price, they'd rather you know, get in there for you know, 20 or 30 cents on the dollar and do their own thing. And they feel they have the expertise to, to be successful going that route. Well, I know if I'm opening up a restaurant anytime soon, you're the man that I'm going to to ask for advice. So um, uh, for, for anybody who's listening today, um, I hope you all um, you know, g gathered uh, a, a certain amount of love and affinity for obviously for Zim's if you didn't know about it prior. But for those of you who joined us who wanted to learn all about uh, some of the history, you've got a little bit of the behind the scenes of the thought and the leadership and the, the man uh, as part of the family behind this wonderful business. Um, thank you all for tolerating my disappearance. Um, and I'm sure Steve danced in the moment just beautifully. I'm going to look back at this and chuckle about how I am the one who actually disappeared. But um, thank you all for joining us today. And if there are any questions that didn't get answered, which I know there are a few, I'm going to pass them along to Steve and we will definitely uh, do a nice email reply. Steve's available at steve, S-T-E-V-E, -E, at restaurantreality.com. Um, of course, you can always come check out restaurantreality.com uh, slash Zims to learn more about the history. And of course, you can visit restaurantreality.com if you're an interested buyer or seller and uh, register to become a buyer or seller. And we promise that all of the amazing uh, expert team will help support you throughout the process. Thank you all for coming today. And we wish you all a very happy and healthy summer. And uh, thank you so much for joining. And thank you, Steve, for- uh, thank, you. thank you, Jeremy, for doing a wonderful job uh, facilitating this, uh, this uh, activity and uh, everyone stay healthy. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Here. Bye. Thank you.